Bragging about the time you did something cool a while ago is lame, unless you're Denver trying to land the World Cup. The big thing they ask is, uh, can we get it done? Does the city of Denver have what it takes? And fortunately, we do. The new Republican candidate to run Colorado's elections launches her campaign with the kind of truth that voters don't want to hear. President Biden is not in office because of voter fraud. Is telling the truth any way to win anymore? We'll ask her. And his American dream had a stumbling block. He thought he was an American, but couldn't prove it. All that is next. For Denver to land the 2026 World Cup games, it'll need a good pitch. That's a soccer joke. They will get better, and I've got five years to practice. With some very important people from the soccer world touring town today, Denver's actual pitch went something like, perhaps you remember us from a successful Democratic National Convention we threw? Here's Mark Salinger. <laughs> The plans to bring the World Cup to Denver. Thank you for being here today on this pretty special day. Started well before executives, politicians, and billionaire families walked into a room for a press conference Monday to highlight the city's bid for the world's biggest soccer tournament. There's definitely a nexus between the two. Safety and security is one of the big ones. Back in 2008, Mike Dino was the CEO of the Denver Host Committee for the Democratic National Convention. The playbook he helped create is being used again this time for sports instead of politics. There was a good template that was laid down, but we also had a template from when we hosted the G7 summit, G8 summit in 1997, uh, the Pope's visit in 1993. So we build upon those. When FIFA executives tour Denver today, asking about everything from security to public transportation to hotel capacity, many of the plans come from how Denver handled the 2008 convention. There probably won't be as many people at a World Cup protesting bombs and war, but they have to prepare for big crowds. The same stadium that held Barack Obama's acceptance speech would hold World Cup soccer. The team bidding for the tournament have already reached out to Mike, asking for his perspective. The big thing they ask is, uh, can we get it done? Does the city of Denver have what it takes? And fortunately, we do. The DNC is a great example, right? A lot of cameras on that event, a lot of people involved. Matthew Payne is the executive director of the Denver Sports Commission, bidding for the World Cup. Part of his pitch to FIFA is showing off that Denver successfully hosted the DNC. You've got this certain program that you put together to put something on of that magnitude. And when you have success like that, what that does is just helps you in the future to be able to replicate similar events like that. A lot has changed in 13 years since the DNC, but between sports and politics, a lot has also stayed the same. There are some key differences between the DNC and the World Cup, of course. People from around the world would fly in for the soccer tournament, where the focus on the DNC was mainly here in the United States. Now, the planning committee for the Denver World Cup bid estimates the city would have to invest between 40 and $50 million in different projects around the city, Kyle, to get it ready for the tournament. They're going to they're gonna invest. Is that like the nice way of saying they're going to take 40 to $50 million from taxpayers? They say that it's all going to be private funding, but they haven't exactly said where that 40 to $50 million is coming from. Yeah. Well, it would be cool to see a World Cup in the backyard. I do think, though, that people, anytime, you know, if you give a sports commission a cookie, as my, as my daughter's book goes, they will ask for the Olympics. Uh, are they going to ask for the Olympics? I asked about asking for the Olympics yes. today because we famously got it and then turned it down in 76. They said that they're focused on the World Cup, so a, a non-answer. Ooh, they tried to pull But they're focused on the World Cup. Yeah, all right. Maybe we have to wait till after the World <laughs> Cup to ask them. All right, thank you, Mark. The first well-known Republican to enter the race for Secretary of State is at odds with many leaders in her own party, because former Jeff Co. Clerk Pam Anderson is clear that the elections were not rigged and that Joe Biden is the real, actual president. Our elections are safe and secure, and the outcome of our elections is correct, and we know this because we have public audit boards, public canvas boards, the public, our community members and interested parties work in the elections. And we do all of these steps in Colorado for independent verifiability to give confidence to the voter. And those outcomes are proven through those processes. Pam Anderson, who also led the state's County Clerks Association, is running to face Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Griswold is heavily involved in partisan politics, in campaigns and on cable news, in a way that, that many, but not all, of Colorado's past Secretary of States have avoided. I really believe that we need a secretary that goes back to restoring the trust in the electoral process, 
cut out the hyperpartisan rhetoric and make sure that that confidence is an eroded for voters. You can see my full unedited conversation with GOP Secretary of State candidate Pam Anderson on the next YouTube channel, where among other things, Anderson explained why she would still choose to campaign alongside Republicans who promote election rigging conspiracy theories. So a map will tell you that Aurora is to the right of Denver. And for decades, that was also true politically. As Aurora is growing and gaining political sway statewide, progressives have now taken half of Aurora City Council. Now the part of the nonpartisan council races that will decide which way Aurora leans, they have become really partisan. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Have you seen the colors lately? The vibrant reds, golds, greens, and blues. Wait, I'm not talking about the leaves. The reds, golds, greens, and blues, even pinks of political signs. You can't miss them in Aurora, where the results of next week's four city council races will determine if Aurora continues to lean left or goes back to being conservative. At the time I was running, uh, I was a Republican. Uh, I'm currently an independent, unaffiliated. Bob Laguerre served on Aurora City Council for 17 years with a brief stint as mayor at the end. Most of his time on council was when it was quietly conservative. It's been since I left council that it's gotten the most radical. Liberal council members elected in 2017 and 2019 have been critical of police. In light of the death of Elijah McClain and the response to the protests that followed, the split council also debated but failed to pass an immigration defense fund. I don't think that's beneficial to the residents of the city uh, if you're taking national political issues and then making them the focus of what you do on the city council. When there's issues like climate action or police reform or homelessness, Local government is where there can be a direct impact. Progressive Nicole Johnston resigned from her council seat in June when she moved to Colorado Springs. Her absence has led to a tie on two prominent issues, picking her replacement and voting on Mayor Mike Kaufman's camping ban. Because of the split council, her seat remains vacant until voters pick her replacement next week. And because of two tie votes, the mayor's camping ban can't be brought up again for a few months. And if the liberal leaning candidates win, the camping ban likely won't. If the conservative leaning candidates win, it probably will. I think these candidates are very lockstep with Mayor Kaufman. But because the council races are nonpartisan, you can't look at a sign and know who leans which way, except for this candidate who put his party affiliation on his sign. Despite the split-minded council, two former members can still see eye to eye. I don't think it's, it's good governance to have anything far one way or far the other. The radicals on the right are just as radical as the radicals on the left. There are 15 candidates vying for five council seats in four different races. And as we've said, none of the 15 have a letter next to their name indicating party affiliation. They weren't clever enough like the no mandates guy to sneak their leaning on the ballot. So, Kyle, you have to research to know who leans which way. So this is not unheard of, Marshall, in nonpartisan races that we see across Colorado. And typically, uh, whichever party thinks that they're going to get smoked if people knew their party affiliation, they don't want to talk about it. They're like, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy, you know? Whereas the other party that thinks that the electorate is with them, they're loud and proud. I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. What's happening in Aurora in terms of that? As you heard Johnston, she, she thinks there are certain slate that lean toward Mayor Kaufman, that they're lockstep with him. And I know there's some social media going around where there's a picture of multiple candidates, like this is your one-stop shop guide for who you should vote for. On the liberal leaning side, the Democrats, as you saw, one person has it on their sign, Democrat. We've talked in the past, uh, another candidate calls himself a Democratic candidate. That seems more individual, like, look, I'm the left-leaning person, whereas the ones on the right are like, we're the group that you want to elect if you like Mayor Kaufman's stance. Yeah, and as Marshall examined last week, good conversation about whether nonpartisan elections really do serve voters. Marshall, thank you. We need to talk about male performance issues as in the U.S. mail system, may not deliver your ballot on time if you mail it after today, so you'll need to find a ballot drop box after tonight. There are nearly 400 of them statewide, dozens in Denver. We made this handy interactive map of the locations, plus in-person polling places if you want to do it old school. You can find this map on 9news.com. We'll throw it up on the next Facebook page. Remember, you don't have to drop off your ballot in the county where you live. If it's easier, like to do it at work or whatever, they can sort that out later between the counties. The most important thing is let's just vote. Get that ballot in by Tuesday, November 2nd, 7 p.m. Our next question comes to us via Twitter from Chris Dabner. Chris asked if RTD is responsible for enforcing federal mask mandates on trains and buses. Chris, we took your question straight to RTD. If a customer 
is boarding one of our vehicles, an operator will remind them that masks are required. We also have transit security officers um, on many of our vehicles. That said, RTD stressed that its drivers have a more important job than policing masks. We try not to engage in conversation that will lead to any kind of confrontation. Our operators are tasked with operating the vehicles safely, and they're not tasked with enforcement. The federal mandate for masks on transit will continue through at least mid-January. Can we discuss briefly what an astonishingly beautiful fall we have had here on the Front Range and other parts of Colorado? We didn't have like an early freeze or a big windstorm to, to denude the trees. Denude's a great word. Meteorologist Corey Repenhagen, he likes words too. Always only needs a few for our weather each day. Corey Repenhagen is on the weather beat. Warm glow on fall scruff. It's a rare October feat easing towards winter. That was Corey Repenhagen on the weather beat. Dude loves his haikus. The news is out in another county in our state that next viewers have showed up to help them out in a big way. Your latest Word of Thanks micro giving campaign is the first one specifically for a project in Chafee County. Salida really needs affordable housing, so many communities do. Salida specifically, those folks in the community found the land. They designed a 17-unit project, and they started raising charitable contributions. The more they raise, less they'll have to borrow, the more affordable that housing project will be. So Salida raised $800,000 as a community. And since last week, next viewers have added more than $16,000 to that total. Your word of thanks microgiving campaigns have raised nearly $4.8 million for Colorado's nonprofits. We'll be back with a new idea of how together we can do some good every Wednesday. Guilty of being an idiot, he admits he did dumb on national television. A Colorado pleads guilty for his role in the insurrection. A former Avs player opens up about how he was fighting addiction as we watched him on the ice. And a non-celebrity story of incredible perseverance. I'm used to kind of just overcoming obstacles. His path to the American dream included the surprise that he wasn't an American. That's next. It's too late to apologize, according to Colorado's One Republic. But is it too late to apologize for an insurrection against the Republic? Well, Colorado's going to give sorry a shot. A new court filing, Glenn Wesley Croy tells a federal judge, quote, I am guilty of being an idiot and walking into that building. Prosecutors say he paraded inside the U.S. Capitol like he was on vacation. They want two months of prison time. Croy's defense attorney claims he was influenced by media coverage of former President Trump's false election rigging claims. The faux news defense. Corey has pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and is set to be sentenced next week. The guy who keeps doing illegal things at delicate, beautiful places in Colorado to get public attention has now been convicted. He wants us to say his name, to show the photos of his stunts and maybe mention his company. Nope, nope, and nope. But if you followed the case of the guy doing shenanigans on National Forest Service lands, just know he has now been convicted of a misdemeanor. And we'll update you on whether his sentence includes some of the cash that he made off that self-promotion. Funds that might even pay for some of the damage he did to Colorado land. It's like summer in fall. 82 degrees in Denver today, 20 degrees above average. But it all changes with the arrival of a Pacific storm that'll bring snow to the high country, windy, warm conditions to the front range. We remain under a red flag warning for high fire danger this evening. We'll look for about four to eight inches of snow in the northern and central mountains with scattered rain showers during the afternoon here tomorrow. It'll be windy and a bit cool. And the winter weather advisories extend from steamboat back through the western slope into the southern mountains above 9,500 feet. And in Denver, it'll be a cooler day with rain and then windy and 50s for Wednesday. Back to sunshine at 70 by the weekend. Halloween doesn't look too scary at all. It'll be cooler and cloudy with temperatures in the mid 50s. Tonight's reading recommendation is a spot by our colleague Tom Green. Former AFS player Colin Wilson has written beautifully and vulnerably about the drug addiction he was quietly fighting as he played here. He retired from the Avs a year ago, and at the time, he wrote an open letter through Players' Tribune detailing his struggle with obsessive-compulsive disorder. In a follow-up today in the Players' Tribune, Wilson writes, quote, When I shared my story here last year, I was holding something back. Truth is, I was an addict. This is a raw, open, first-person account of Wilson's addiction to sleeping pills, alcohol, and cocaine. He also writes about how he retook control of his life. 
and how he's going back to school to help others do the same. Great article. There's a link on the next Facebook page. You know, what's life without struggle and sacrifice? At a time when we need more nurses, Colorado looks back at the moment that inspired him to become a nurse and the unusual path he took to get here. And this is the time of year when the wind blows just right and turns your house into a weed shop. Next. There are jobs out there that take real toughness. How about nursing, especially during a pandemic? CU nursing student shared his unusual path to get there. And I kind of have a unconventional uh, story. Hi, my name is Gabriel Topol. I am a senior here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I came to the country when I was about seven or eight years old. Uh, originally born in Japan, I was adopted. I went to three high schools here in four years. I joined the military in 2015. I decided to do the military for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think for me it was to get my citizenship. When I came over to the United States, uh, I had all my original documentation and my parents tried to apply for citizenship in California. I guess something happened where my paperwork either got lost. Uh, there was also an incident with one of the immigration offices having a fire. I got my green card and then shortly after I took my exam for my citizenship test. Well, I started nursing school, I would say just last year. When I was a child, I got really sick. And I just remember one time um, this guy kept coming in and out of the room and I was a little delirious, but I, I kept referring to him. I was like, oh, doc, doc, doc. And he kept correcting me and he was like, no, 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 I'm not the doctor, I'm your nurse. And it got me thinking at a young age and I was like, oh, wow, this is uh, really cool. I didn't really know this was like a profession, a thing. So I graduate May of next year. I think what I would tell someone that's in my shoes is have hope, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but also know that your situation is your story and it's unique to you. So own it, embrace it, and love it. Gabriel shared his story through the lens of our photojournalist Byron Reed. After graduation, he plans to become an aeromedical evacuation flight nurse. That sounds tough too. Right now he's an Air Force reservist. If you set a tumbleweed free and it comes back to you, pick it up. Don't try to roll it to your neighbors again. That and a new addition to our team here next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is like waste management meets the Wild West. Makes me wonder how the early homesteaders dealt with this because they didn't have those, those big trash bins. Danielle Royer spotted this in Denver Central Park neighborhood. Posted it online. Somebody replied saying that uh, what you're supposed to do in terms of disposing this is that you set them free. I'm curious what that person's neighbors think about that strategy. What's the most Colorado thing you saw today? Email it to next at 9news.com or tweet it in our general direction using the hashtag HeyNext. The next team is seven pounds heavier these days, and we're thrilled about it. Anusha Roy and her husband welcomed their new baby boy last week. Mom and baby are doing well. They are back home. Unclear on the rest front. Uh, goes to the territory, right? Anusha says he got a good set of lungs on him. Congratulations to Anusha and her family. She's planning to be back in a few months. Bob Bo from Thornton writes in tonight about our story on the guy who keeps doing outrageous and illegal things on public lands. Finally, a news program that publicly states it will not publish the name of a criminal. Hurrah! Well, Bob, if, if the case is that the criminal appears to be doing something for attention to promote a company or himself, one and done seems good on the name there. Tom, great thought. What makes people proposing the World Cup in Denver think that the residents of Colorado want or need world recognition? See you next time.